All right, cool, awesome. Um, all right, so I'm here today to talk about Autotune, a uh, automated database tuning service uh, that we've been working on actually for several years at the university, uh, and we have recently spun this off as a as a new startup. Um, so for today's talk, we're going to first talk about uh, the background about what we mean for an automatic automatic database tuning service um, in Autotune, and then we'll describe how Autotune actually works. And then I'll present two field studies that we've done of actually running Autotune uh, outside of the university, running this in, in, in real deployments. And we'll so, so to discuss some of the lessons we've learned from trying to automatically you know, use machine learning to automatically tune databases in the wild. And then I'll finish up talking about what's going to happen next for Autotune. So we have, we have some, some exciting news or, uh, to, to announce here as well. So the problem that we're focused on is, is knob tuning. So a, a database configuration knob is a runtime parameter that controls the behavior, the internal behavior of the database system. Right? Every database system has these knobs, things like cat, you know, cache sizes, uh, buffer policies, log file sizes, and so forth, and various features. And they expose these knobs to you as the, the administrator or the user of the database system in order for you to set them correctly for how your application is going to be using the database system. So the way these knobs get generated is that as the developer was building the database system, they added a new feature and had to uh, make a decision to how to set some aspect of it. And instead of just hard coding a value, they say, let me just kick it out as a configuration knob because I'll assume someone else more intelligent is going to come along and know how to set it up correctly. The challenge, though, of course, now is that if you have, you know, if there's dozens or hundreds of these knobs, it's impossible for any one human to be able to tune that for a single application, let alone if you have a large database fleet, you know, you know dozens or even hundreds of thousands of, of databases. There's no way a human can actually tune every single database for the, you know, for the application that, that's running on it. So. The, just give you a, a sense of how bad this problem is. This is a survey that my PhD student did where she looked at the last 20 year release history of the two most popular open source databases, Postgres and MySQL. And for every new release, she just counted the number of configuration knobs that they had listed in, in the documentation. And so you can see in the very beginning, in, in the beginning of the century, both MySQL and Postgres had, had under 100 knobs. But then over 20 years, MySQL grew by 7x and Postgres grew by 5x. So now, not all of these knobs will affect performance, right? Some of these knobs are file names, uh, port numbers, host names. Or these are obviously things you don't want to tune other than setting them once for your application or for your deployment uh, and, and being done with it, because otherwise it wouldn't operate correctly. Um, but there are still enough knobs that will affect performance. And again, at this scale, this is not something that uh, humans can easily reason about. So how are people managing uh, to tune databases today? Well, there's basically four approaches. The first is to, to DIY it, do it yourself. And so we see this more often in sort of the, the Silicon Valley style companies, the DevOps style companies, where you don't have a traditional database administrator role. Typically, it's the person at the company, whoever set up the database at their last job, they get the, you know, they draw the, the short straw and are responsible for setting up the database at, you know, at the new company. Um, so, what they end up doing is just Googling, you know, how to tune whatever database you want to tune, and you're going to find a bunch of these blog articles uh, from, from various companies and consulting firms that says that will say roughly, here's the five or six knobs for each database that, that you're going to want to tune. And so oftentimes, people are blindly setting these things without really knowing what they're doing because they don't understand the internals of the database system. Um, and also, we have found that in some cases for some applications, what these blogs actually recommend are exactly opposite of what you want to do, or actually what they're, what they're telling you to do is, is incorrect for different applications. And how do you know whether your application is one of the ones that should be following these guidelines or not following these guidelines uh, is, is, you know, is, is not easy to, 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 to determine. All right, so say that you do go to the, down the traditional path and hire DBA. Well, one is that they're expensive. Um, so this is the, the Department of Labor Statistics from the federal US government where they did a survey of the salary of a year of different, different roles. Uh, and for here, they're saying that the average salary of a DBA in the United States is $96,000 a year. Um, if you ever talk to people on the East Coast and West Coast, this, you know, since this is the average, you know, in, in the, in those sort of coasts in the United States, the, the price is much, much higher. 
it's all, the problem also there with the, you know, besides being expensive, humans aren't scalable, right? So I mentioned that if, you know, maybe a human could do one tuning on a, on, a, on a tuning from one database, but if I have hundreds of databases, I have to hire a lot of humans to, to tune them. And DBAs are already overstretched in, in terms of time as it is now, right? So they have, to, they have a bunch of other stuff they have to worry about in their daily job. And tuning is always sort of kicked down the road and something that they just don't have time for. So the next approach is to use rule-based tools. Um, and all the major commercial databases, uh, IBM, Oracle, and SQL Server have these tools. There are available ones from the open, from open source uh, community. Percona has one for MySQL, and there's PGTune for Postgres. And these tools are basically like a plug and chug formula. You tell the tool how many CPU cores you have, how much RAM you have, maybe what your disk looks like. And they have these built-in formulas that will spit out a recommendation for you know, a, a small number of knobs that the system that you could tune. Um, and again, these are sort of like meant to be general purpose. They're not going to be sort of very specific to your application because they're only looking at some basic information about what your application is actually using on the database system. So what I'm here to talk about today, and what I argue is the better approach is to apply machine learning techniques to do black box optimization uh, in the database system. So by black box, we mean that we don't need to modify the internals of the system. We only need to uh, operate on the, the, the information that the system exposes us through the standard APIs. And that's enough of a, of a signal for our machine learning algorithms to be able to determine how to tune these knobs correctly. So AutoTune is a machine learning based tuning service that we've developed uh, both in, in the as an academic project and then very recently have spun it out as a startup. And now we're offering this as a commercial uh, software as a service product. And the basic idea of AutoTune is that it's going to use machine learning to be able to figure out how to best tune your, the configuration knobs for each, each individual database system. And so instead of having a uh, sort of common config across all your databases, we can get better performance by, and, and, and better efficiency by targeting how exactly how the application is using the database. So AutoTune supports tuning Postgres, MySQL, and Oracle. Um, and we support uh, running AutoTune or databases that are running on Amazon RDS or either self-managed in the cloud or in um, uh, on, on premise and private data centers. So this is always risky uh, to, to, to give a live demonstration of a, of a you know, new software. Um, but I'm going to roll the dice and, and, and go for it. Um, so I'm going to give a demonstration of the new uh, the SaaS version of AutoTune where we're going to run Postgres version 11 and with the TPCC benchmark hitting it. And then we're going to start with the, the default configuration that Amazon gives you on RDS and see how AutoTune can improve that performance, improve the performance by tuning the knobs uh, while I give this talk. And to provide a baseline for this, uh, for this evaluation, we're also going to run TPCC on another Postgres 11 database in RDS. But we're not going to do any tuning on that. We're just going to run with the the default configuration uh, that Amazon gives you. So um, if we go into the AutoTune tool, uh, we'll create a new database. And so in the first step here, we have to specify what, um, uh, you know, what version what we're using Postgres. And because we're going to be running on Amazon RDS, there's a bunch of information that we have to provide it. Um, so the first thing we have to do is give it the RDS identifier. On my mouse, sorry, that sucks. And then we need to provide what, what region we're running into, running in RDS. And then we're going to give a nickname. So we'll just call this uh, the tuning DB. And then uh, I'm not going to show this, but you have to go into Amazon and provide it with uh, to set up a, a, an IAM uh, role for the database. This is going to allow AutoTune to connect to, to Amazon and make sure that it can retrieve all the, the right information that it needs from Amazon CloudWatch. Um, this is really annoying, sorry. That will click Next. And when Am then AutoTune is going to connect to the database, uh, validate that it has credentials through, through RDS. Um, and make sure that it, it can retrieve the right information that it needs. And then on the, uh, on the next page will come up, we'll be able to specify what tuning options we want to do. So we can specify whether we want AutoTune to tune the database or uh, monitor it. 
right? So monitoring would just be collecting the, the metrics that, we, that we're using. Um, you also have to specify whether we want to restart the database or not. And this is because uh, there are some knobs that actually don't take effect in, uh, in, until you actually restart the database system. So for this demonstration, to keep things simple, we're not going to do any uh, restarts. And for this one, we're going to just use the, uh, the eight recommended knobs that Autotune has learned has the most impact and performance for most of the databases that it's seen uh, for, for Postgres. All right, so then on the last page, what we'll do is we'll specify um, the, the username that, that Autotune needs to log into the database um, and collect the, um, to collect the stats. Um, and then we need to provide a ARN that RDS provides us for, uh, for, for connecting to, or setting the, uh, the configuration ops. All right, so then we go down, click Finish. Um, and again, same thing, we'll log into the database, make sure that we have the right credentials, and that we can retrieve all the information that we need. Um, and you know, and it's to make sure that Amazon provides the right, right access that we need for the database. The important thing to point out here is that the, the permissions we need, give, we need to give to Autotune to connect to the database are actually quite limited. So we don't need to see any user data. We don't need to see any user queries, anything from your application. There's no sensitive data that we're collecting. It's just the runtime metrics of, of the system. So we failed on that. That stinks. All right. All right. So let's go keep, we'll come back to this. Uh, but for now, again, here's his example of the monitoring database. Um, and so it's going to collect its performance over time. So we'll get the tuning database set up, and then we'll, we'll come back to that. OK? OK. So while the demo is running, uh, let's talk about how what Autotune works. So as I said, you provide some basic information to Autotune about how to connect to your database. right? You set up some permissions in, in case of running an RDS. And again, these are just permissions to collect the runtime metrics. Um, and then the driver will then connect to the database uh, and retrieve the, the current metrics of the system, as well as the, the last configuration that we have set up. And then we're going to store this, 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 these metrics of information in Autotune's internal repository, along with all the other uh, data we've collected from the other databases. And then we'll have a compute engine train statistical models, machine learning models, based on this data that's going to allow it to predict how the database system's performance will change as we start changing from the values of the knobs that we're tuning. And then the compute engine will generate a new configuration that the driver then installs into the database uh, and then observes its effect to see whether things make, uh, made, how much we made things better. And so we'll continue, complete, complete, uh, continuously execute this process, applying new configurations, collecting the metrics, and then learning over time uh, how things change. And then from this, we can then determine whether we have the optimum configuration uh, for your database. And again, we don't need to collect any, uh, any user information or any, anything, anything about the queries about the data. We just need these metrics. And that's enough for us to determine what your application is actually doing. So to give an example of what kind of performance benefit uh, we can get, uh, so in this is the same experiment that I was showing before. We're running uh, TPCC on Postgres RDS. Um, and so we're going to show it in two different setups. The first will be a more expensive uh, instance size with 4,000 provision IOPS, and then we'll have a less expensive one with less provision IOPS. So the white line, the white bar here is what you get from Amazon uh, with their default configuration when you set up RDS. So there's surprisingly a large number of people that actually still use the default configuration that Amazon gives you. They don't know how to set the, the other knobs. Um, and Amazon has already done some basic tuning for it. But again, it's, it's sort of the, again, the lowest common denominator. It's not for your specific application. The blue bar is what PG Tune will give you when you, you punch in the values of this instance size uh, and apply those changes. And then the red bar here is what Autotune can get from tuning the, the data specifically for the application that's running on it. But the thing that's kind of cool, so in addition to getting better performance on the same instance size, if we run the, the same workload on a less expensive instance size, we see that Autotune is able to get basically the same performance you're, you're getting on the more expensive one, but at half the price. So this instance costs $17,000 a year from Amazon. And then this cheaper one, where we're getting the same performance after tuning it, we can get uh, it's around $8,500 a year. So it's, it's the, the cost uh, exactly half. So we ought to sort of set things up for you to decide whether you want to just get better performance or make a decision about whether you want to cut your costs. It can support both scenarios. All right, so let's talk about two field studies we've had of Autotune showing you outside of the lab or outside of running synthetic workloads like TPCC, what kind of benefit we can get. So 
in uh, in 2018, a uh, a major French bank reached out to us, and they said they had a thousand Postgres installations that they were running on prem that they wanted to use AutoTune to, to to set up and optimize for them. So what was really interesting about the setup was they had a sort of a the IT uh, group had a self provisioning uh, infrastructure in place where you just go to a website and say almost like RDS and say I want this database, but then you also provide some basic information about like you know how, how many cores and in, 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 in hardware how much hardware you wanted, but also what the workload little looked like, and they already had manually tuned uh, a, a small number of configurations based on what that selection was. Um, so they asked us that okay, so we. We have a thousand Postgres installations. We wanted you know, they wanted us to try to try to run AutoTune on them and see what kind of benefit we can get. So we uh, this was back when we were at the university, and so we did a collaboration with them as a research project uh, where we worked with a, a French intern on site in Paris to get AutoTune up and running. Um, it took several months, uh, but after we got it working, they had went to go look at the, actually the real databases and see how they could start optimizing thing, uh, things. And so they originally told us a thousand. But it turns out the real number was one, uh, because the bank apparently had this big initiative a few years ago where they said, we need to start using more open source software. So they meant for every new project in the budget justification, you had to specify what open source software you're using. So then the word got around the bank that if you just click the checkbox in the form and say, I'm going to use Postgres, uh, then you, know, you could spin up a Postgres instance on their self-provisioned uh, infrastructure. But then you never used it, never put any data in it, and you just used Oracle and paid Oracle like you normally would. So they literally had a thousand Postgres installations with nothing in it, and the one Postgres database that did have something in it was barely being used. So that this was a bust. Uh, so then they came back to us and said, "Okay, we're we're primarily an Oracle shop. Um, you know, can you make AutoTune work on Oracle?" So it took about a few months to get AutoTune ported to Oracle. And there's no real change we have to make in the machine learning algorithms. So the machine learning algorithms don't care what number, you know, what database you're using. It just sees a bunch of numbers. But there is some changes we have to make on the driver side to actually connect to the database and make sure we're getting the right information and massaging it to put it into the form that we need in our repository. So for this one, they gave us a one terabyte database that had already actually been manually tuned by their in-house expert DBAs. So they did index tuning, query tuning, and knob tuning, and no one was able, able to make a real serious dent in it. Um, What's also interesting about this is that the target objective that they wanted to focus on was this thing called DB time. Um, and if you're not familiar with this, this is basically Oracle's proprietary metric to, that they use to determine the performance of the database. So whereas before, we would always been looking at latency and throughput. So we had to extend Auditor to support this uh, you know, arbitrary user-defined metric that uh, didn't exist in any other database systems. So the way we set this up was uh, everything was running on-prem. Um, so we had, they had the Oracle database that we wanted to tune. They took a snapshot of the production database and then brought it up on uh, a bunch of VMs that were running on the same hardware as the production machine. But then they also captured a workload of the database running production. And so we, now we can run that workload over and over again uh, on, the, on these backup clones and not interfere with the, the production database. And once we found a better configuration, they would then promote it to uh, run it in production. So the first step, the driver would then uh, start the database up and immediately check the logs. Uh, and this is something you have to do because sometimes you may set invalid configurations and the database system re will refuse to start. And so rather than you know, this, if you start it up and it doesn't come back up, uh, as opposed to being some you know, hardware failure or some other issue, you, can, you have to scrape the logs to determine whether the problem was because AutoTune set something incorrectly. All right, so the next step, we would then reload the database from the snapshot, and that puts us back to the original state the database was in um, when, the, you know, when we took the snapshot from the production database. And they had, Oracle's got pretty good tools for this, so, so this actually didn't, doesn't, take that much, doesn't take that long. So now, one thing that we did differently uh, that we haven't done in other deployments is that immediately after loading the database, we would run a, a sort of mini benchmark, a micro benchmark using FIO, to measure the performance of the disk that, that the database was reading and writing to. And we had to do this because the, all the databases that we were testing on uh, were running on a uh, the shared disk architecture. They had, had a network attached storage that all the, the databases would read and write to. And they had to do this because of regulations uh, at the bank where a VM wasn't allowed to have local storage. So everything always had to go to this uh, shared disk for uh, auditing reasons. The problem was, though, the the, the the shared network or the, the, their, their internal cloud 
was actually kind of noisy. So at different times, you'd run our experiments and, and do our tuning evaluation, uh, we would get widely different performance. Right? And so we needed a way to determine whether things got worse because the disk got slow or because of something that we did when we were tuning the database. Right? To give you an idea how bad this actually was, so this is a over three days running FIO. The blue line here is what you get when you run a local local SSD. The red line would be when you have was was the shared disk at the bank. And you can see that sometimes performance spikes by three x. Uh, and so we had to work on our algorithms to determine whether you know, we see a reduction in performance because of the disk or something that we did. All right. So then the first the next step was that we would collect the metrics from the system, uh, and then we would run the workload again. The workload trace is replaying the queries. Um, and then once that was finished, we then collect the metrics again, because now we want to take a delta of any counters that we collected at the beginning and see what they are at, at the end, right? So there's some things like cumulative uh, data read. So we'd measure it before and after, subtract it, and that would tell you how much work you actually did when you, when you ran the, the workload. And then we would ship this information over to Autotune, and we would use this to build our models. And Autotune would then generate a new recommendation configura new rec recommended configuration then apply the change and then restart the process all over again. So uh, I want to show one graph of what we were able to achieve at, at, at the bank here. So on this side of the graph, you see the, the, the measured performance of the database using the hand-tuned configuration from, from the DBAs. And then over, over multiple iterations, you see the best configuration that Autotune was able to achieve reduces the resource consumption as defined by DB time by 50%. So, that, I'm not sharing the time scale here, but this is roughly about three days for this one deployment, um, tuning you know about twenty knobs or so. So okay, this is great. Like, so we so we said, fantastic. We can reduce the overhead of this database by fifty percent. So we go back to the bank guys, and we're like, okay, look how much you know how much better things are. How much money are you going to save with this, right? Can you shut down machines? Can you you know you know can you turn off some CPUs and pay Oracle less because Oracle charges per CPU core? And they were like, we have no idea because we've never been in a position to pay Oracle less money. Um, so we think this is a significant improvement for them. And they're looking at running Autotune at other, other databases now because of these results. Uh, but in terms of how do you equate this back to a cost savings, uh, it's too soon to say for that. All right, so what are some things we learned from this deployment? Um, so I'm going to go through sort of three main takeaways. So the first thing was that no surprise, humans make mistakes. Even human experts make mistakes. So prior to our evaluation for them or deployment of Autotune for them, they were running Oracle uh, 11. And then they upgraded to Oracle 12. Uh, and they had tuned the database when they were on 11, but they forgot to, to tune the database for this one particular instance again when they were on 12. So there were some pretty obvious things that they should have fixed or should have changed uh, that Autotune figured out. So we figured out, obviously, that the the, the cache size should have been much larger than they were ha they, they had because you know somebody forgot to set that as as they were going forward, um, and so the solution to this, in my opinion, is just more automation. Right, the if you have a way to to sort of monitor the situation of the database, determine whether the environment has changed or the workload has changed or the database system itself has changed, uh, and then we can determine whether it's time to run you know the the recommendation algorithm again to, to see whether uh, you should be upgrading or changing your, your knobs. But of course, people are very, um, DBAs especially, are very conservative about making large changes. And so we, we think we need a way to be able to uh, predict and advise what kind of benefit you are going to get before you make the change um, to help sort of assuage any fear, uh, fears about jumping into a new configuration right away. All right, so the next challenge we faced was how to replay the workload. As I said, it was a workload trace of all the SQL queries and transactions, and we would just rerun that every time uh, we in, a, in each new iteration. Um, the challenge, though, is that in order to make sure our measurements were, were consistent from one iteration or one configuration to the next, we had to make sure that the workload we were executing was the same. But now the problem is that some workloads would, if you have a bad configuration, when you replay the workload, could take a long time, right? So I could. Uh, if I have a bad configuration, if I try to replay a trace that takes 20 minutes, but normally now it takes two hours, uh, that's you know it's two hours of time wasted for not getting any information other than I know this configuration was bad. So the solution to this was that we would just recognize that we're running two or three times longer than we normally should, 
and we would terminate the workload, you know, kill the run, kill the iteration, provide information back to the 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 the, the, you know, the auto-tune service, the machine learning algorithm, say what you tried before was bad, and try something else. But now the challenge is, as I said, since we have those metrics, some of them are cumulative. If I cut the workload off before it actually finishes, then it may look like I was actually doing really well in terms of the amount of work I was doing with those metrics because I end up not do, running the whole queries, right? Like if I run half the trace and therefore I read half the amount of data from disk, that looks good, right? So we need a way to then provide feedback back to the algorithm and say things, things went bad. So there's actually three scenarios we got to deal with. So the first one I've already talked about is when you have a slow query, slow trace execution, you cut them off early, uh, but then you report back to the, the models and say, hey, we cut this off early, and it can account for that. The next issue is, is I already talked about as well, is when the database fails to start. Right? So you say you give it a bad configuration, uh, and then it'll, it'll throw an error. Like, so in case of Postgres, if you set the buffer pool size to a negative value, you know, it, it'll throw an error like, like, like this. So we need to be able to recognize when this occurs. The more nuanced one, the more tricky one, is when the, the data system will fail or crash because of a bad configuration, but it doesn't happen right away upon startup. Like you run for a little bit, and then it tries to do something in the system, and then it crashes. So in the case of Oracle, there was some buffer we would set uh, that when the system started, it wouldn't allocate that memory right away. It was only when you later then try to do something in the system, we would try to allocate that memory, and it would crap out and, and throw an error. So you need to account for this one as well. So how do we identify when it's a failure? As I said before, we scrape the log and, and for each database system, looking for certain keywords and try to identify when things are bad because of a configuration mistake. Um, luckily, this is actually not that hard to do. It's the delayed ones are a bit more tricky because you just don't know what's going to fail until it fails. Um, but for, for Postgres and MySQL, we're confident that we, we've captured them all. But now the tricky thing is that how do we incorporate uh, information or how do we give a signal back to the machine learning algorithms and say this configuration caused a failure never try it again so in the, the the easiest approach and the best approach that we found is just to set the bad configurations objective value like what was it throughput what, what a latency was uh to be whatever the worst thing you've ever seen before and that's enough to tell the the models to stay away from it but it's not a negative affinity uh, which would cause the sort of uh, the machine learning algorithms or the model to to freak out because now it's a giant step or you know, an abyss in the solution curve that the math can't easily uh, deal with. So we've tried setting it to be two x the worst or three x the worst, uh, which is often what people recommend in the machine learning literature. We haven't found it made a difference. All right, so now I want to talk about the the next deployment that we did. Um, and so for this one, I can't say the name just yet. Uh, uh, it's a major travel website that you've heard of. Uh, you know, we're very excited to have them on the books with us, so to speak. So uh, they came to us and said, we want to support uh, uh, MySQL version 8 to tune their read replicas running in their, their for, in, for the backend data services uh, on-prem in, in Europe. So this is a, uh, a, a read-heavy workload where you're running queries to, for analysts and other things going on the backend. It's not serving the, the front-end website. And so for this one, they've already have in their chef scripts or puppet scripts formulas that they've created that can look at the hardware that's available to the machine that the database is running on and preset the, some, some, some knobs based on that. And whenever there was uh, an issue came up, maybe the DBAs then would do some manual tuning. But they had hundreds of databases, and at their scale, again, humans weren't able to do that. So for this one, we're going to tune uh, 20 knobs in MySQL. Um, and it's going to be a combination of, of both dynamic knobs and static knobs. So a dynamic knob is, is a knob that you can change that doesn't require a restart before it takes effect. Uh, the static knobs do require a restart. Um, yeah, and every database system has a combination of both. The commercial ones are, commercial databases are much better. They have fewer knobs that require a restart than the open source ones. The open source ones are getting better. But again, everyone has this issue. And for this one, the target objective was rather than like you know pure performance like DB time, what they wanted was to reduce the hardware utilization of the database system or, or, or maximize the utilization because uh, they were sort of they were under provision or over provision now, so they wanted to maintain the same P99 latency of all the queries, 
uh, but improve the utilization of the system. And what's also interesting about this is that unlike in the, in the, the French banks case, where we were running on a clone, we didn't have to worry about affecting the production database. This, uh, for this deployment here, we're actually gonna run on the production read replicas uh, that were actually serving live queries. Because again, it's backend services. If we, if we restart or change, change a knob and things go bad, they had enough spare capacity in the pool to, to absorb the additional queries that, that, that our machine took down. But because uh, you know, they, they were on pager duty, they would only allow us to tune it during the workday when they were, they were going to be around and, and be able to fix things for us. And they only allowed us to, to restart the database once per day. All right, so, so the way this setup was, uh, again, everything was running on-prem. Uh, because we were running on the production databases, right, the read replicas, and we didn't have a workload trace that we could replay over and over again as we did in the French bank, we needed a second database set up that we'd use as the baseline to determine whether the changes we were making to our database, to the, to the database we were tuning, were actually was actually making things better, right? So we would have a, a, the, the database we were going to tune make, and allow auto tuning to make changes, and then we have the database again as the control database that we weren't going to make any changes. And it's similar to the demo that I'm giving now, where I have the tuning database and the monitoring database. They're basically running the same workload on the same hardware, and then we would know that if we make things better here, it's not just because the application submitted less queries or you know, something changed in the workload. It's because we know that the because uh, the, the tuning made things better. So when the driver has to start, it collects data, it connects to both the, the tuning database and the control database. Uh, and we're going to read a combination of both uh, the internal InnoDB statistics that MySQL generates. They're running on version 8, which is great because the perf new performance schema stuff that came out in version 8 is way better than 5.7. So the, the metrics are more rich, which is better for AutoTune. But then we've also extended AutoTune to support connecting to uh, a third party sources like Telegraph to go get the OS metrics from, from the machine that the, the database is running on. All right, so now we're then we're just going to wait for a bit because again, the application is actually running queries on, on, on these databases while we're waiting. And then after a certain bit of period of time, we'll then connect to these guys again, compute the delta between the two metrics we collected before and after, and then ship this over into AutoTune, again, who then trains the machine learning models to predict, uh, to generate a new configuration that we then install into the, the tuning database. And then depending or not whether this is the one time we wanted to restart the database, uh, we could restart it. Otherwise, we just apply the changes and repeat the process. So to give a summary of, kind of the, the performance that we've, we benefit we've gotten, so we targeted one application pool or one read replica pool first, proved that it worked there, and, and the results were so good that they we then extended it to a, another MySQL version 8 database deployment. Um, and so what you can see in the first application here, we're maintaining roughly the same latency. We're only we're actually getting slightly better, 1.4%, but we're getting uh, pretty significant improvements in the, uh, the CPU utilization and the number of running threads. So at this, the amount of uh, read replicas that were available in this pool for this first application, when you're reducing the CPU usage by like 22%, the back of the envelope calculation for these guys is that they think they can turn off definitely one, but maybe even two machines. Um, you see about a 10% improvement for the second application, but a pretty significant savings in, in, in the P99. Um, so for the second poll, we think we can turn off maybe one database or one, one machine. So again, they have, this is just sort of two read replica pools in their giant fleet. You know, if you start looking at all the hundreds of, of, of pools that they have, you know, now you're turn, maybe turning off hundreds, you know, a hundred or dozens of machines. That starts to add up both in terms of hardware, co uh, location costs, co-location costs in the data center, uh, as well as you know, licensing for you know, support for, the, for these databases. So they're pretty excited about this as well. Um, we hope to be able to talk more publicly about you know, the kind of benefit we, we've got for these guys. So what do we learn from these two deployments? Uh, so the first one will be external factors and how to actually tune knobs and then how to handle restarts, which I wasn't really an issue, or we, we did cover some things about this in the for the French bank, but it matters more in this environment. So the first thing that sort of surprised us was that there are some times where the DBAs will make changes or set knobs a certain way due to external reasons that are not easily known by the machine learning algorithm. Like some internal protocol at the company or the organization said, this is how we're going to tune our databases. And it's not something that we can easily you know, you know, infer uh, with our machine learning models. 
So in this case here for the for the the, the travel website, they actually set the buffer pool size to be uh, half of what the total amount of memory was available on the database system. And then Autotune comes along and says, hey, you should you should increase this to like 80 or 90 percent. Now I will say when you increase it to 90 percent, that wasn't all. You, know, it, it, you only got a, a small amount of improvement for these two applications. Um, so it wasn't like you know they were artificially hampering performance by running with a lower amount of memory, um, but it you know it does matter. So when we found out what you know we asked them why were you setting the the, the buffer pool size to be half of what was half the amount of memory that was available, it turns out that they do this because they were concerned about sort of flash mobs or rogue app, rogue applications starting submitting a flood of queries all at once, and then the uh, you'd run out of memory when you try to handle all the con new connections for these uh, queries coming in. So they had set this artificially low. But it turns out there's an internal debate at the company about whether they actually needed to do this or not. And they're happy to see that Autotune is uh, sort, of, sort of additional argument for in favor of increasing that uh, buffer pool size. So the way we need to handle this is that we now expose in the, we can expose in, in the, the user interface of Autotune uh, the, uh, the ability to set the range values for knobs. So, Rather than taking all the memory that's available to the, to, you know, to, to on the machine, you could set it to be, uh, you know, half the size or whatever else we want to be, and the models know not to exceed that boundary. All right. The next issue is how to handle restarts. Um, again, as I said, some knobs don't take effect until you restart, uh, but of course now nobody likes to restart their database because downtime is bad. It costs money, causes problems. So they want to minimize the amount of, amount of downtime. But the challenge is that some some databases will have different uh, restart times based on how you set the knobs. And it isn't a matter of what, the, what value you set the knob to. It matters what the value was uh, at that moment of time when you set it to something else. So an example of this would be like the log file size in, in MySQL. So if my current log file size is 5 gigs, and I send it to 10 gigs, and I restart, then when MySQL comes back up, it says, OK, well, my log file size is currently 5 gigs, but the max can be 10 gigs. I don't need to do anything. I'm done. But if I send it to, you know, if I set it to one gig, then I come back up and it says, all right, well, I'm currently five gigs. I have to start compacting the log because I need to get it down to that, that restricted size. So the challenge is, of course, now, you know, how to know when you know this is going to occur and how to try to predict how long it's going to take so that we can expose something to the, the user and say, okay, well, we're going to restart and we think it's going to take this amount of time. All right. So the first problem is how to know when you're even allowed to restart. So this is actually a something that we have to be told, as I showed in, in, in my setup of the demo, because Autotune doesn't know whether restarting is OK or not. right? It doesn't know whether the database is connected to the application or it's running a clone in the back end. So you have to tell us whether you want to restart, because that's a value judgment that the, the, the machine learning models can't make on their own. And then you can also then tell us how many times you're allowed to restart per day uh, and to restrict it from trying to restart all the time. Then the next challenge is how long it's going to take to determine how long it's going to take to restart, so we can provide the administrator with some guidance to say, okay, we're going to restart at this time per day, and it's going to take this amount of time to, to, before it comes back up because we changed the knobs this way. So this one, unfortunately, is an open problem. There's a lot of factors to consider, uh, and we have some ideas of how think we want to solve it. Just we haven't done the work yet to to, to prove that it actually works. But this is something that we're, we're looking forward to in the future. Okay. So what I've showed so far is that we can do database tuning in, in with using machine learning, um, and you know we we can get get some pretty good benefits from this. So what's next for us? So we announced yesterday that the commercial version of Autotune is available uh, as private beta, and so uh, we're looking for people to start trying it out. And then we support Postgres and MySQL now. Uh, we've supported Oracle in the in the open source or academic version of Autotune, um, but the the, the, the feedback we've gotten the most from is that people want us to support Aurora and MariaDB next. Um, MariaDB should be easy because you know it's, it's based on MySQL, so everything should still work. Same thing for, for Aurora. Uh, since the front end is still Postgres and MySQL, we think that uh, all our you know, APIs and everything should still work. We just haven't tested this yet. All right, so this is fine. We can keep expanding the types of databases that we want to support, expanding different cloud platforms, um, but it's you know, I, I, how do I say this? I'm excited by it, but I'm not. It's not. I'm not getting the same high I did when you know I was doing research on this, right? 
yeah, you know, it's a business. We, you know, we want to try to help people and, and have the business grow, but it's not, it's not what I think is what we really need to go as, you know, as, as a project for AutoTune. So just, you know, having a automated tuning service just isn't enough to get people to pay attention to what you're doing, to have your name ring out in the streets and people respect and fear you, um, you know, the way sort of other animals fear, fear otters. So I'm very excited to announce today that we are releasing, or we are now set up also a subsidiary of AutoTune. Uh, the company is now AutoTune the Records. So our goal for this is that it will be the premier record label for both otter and database related music um, in, the, in the hip hop genre. So we have a, our label page is set up now. Um, and we're also excited to announce that we're releasing our first album. Uh, this is a EP that we've recorded in the last year. Uh, There's a group called OKA out of New York City. Um, and it's basically otters uh, rapping over um, some old school hip hop beats. Um, so it's available for digital download now on Bandcamp and will be on Spotify and Apple Music and SoundCloud uh, later in the week. Um, but you can go to Bandcamp now and, and, and take a look at it. And so we're, we're very, very excited about this. So uh, what have I shown today? So I've shown that uh, how we can use machine learning to solve the configuration tuning problem for, for database systems. Um, there's you know, the, there are some bunch of database problems and much machine learning problems you have to deal with. And we think AutoTune is sort of the right amalgamation of both of these disciplines to be able to, you know, provide a real benefit uh, for people. And I've shown that we have two different scenarios. Oh. Andy, your database is now optimized and ready to use. Right. So let me, let me, let's go. I wish we had that though. So let's go check out the demo. Um, right. So we'll go back now to uh to 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 this is the database i tried to set up before and didn't work um so we can go into performance charts but here you can see that we've so far we've improved the performance by uh 53 percent of of over the, the default configuration that that uh that amazon provides you so under configurations we can see all the configurations that we tried out um and we can click on them and see like here's you know here's what actually autotune is is setting so now we can go under the performance charts and see how performance is, is, is changing over time. So again, our initial con default configuration from, from, from Amazon gave us uh, about roughly 1,500 transactions a second. Um, and you can see that in the beginning, AutoTune was trying out new configurations and learning about how things uh, were improving. Um, but then it dips down here, and this is, this is you, know, you need to understand this, the machine learning models are tools trying to figure things out. They're exploring the solution space to determine what how to set the different knobs. And over time, it becomes more confident that it knows that different regions of the solution space are better than others. Um, and then eventually, it will converge and produce a, uh, a you know, an, an optimal configuration. So again, we're running the um, we're running the, the the monitoring database as well with the same workload, and we want to compare how well we're doing against that. So we can modify the chart and add the monitoring DB to it. And then uh, while running at the same time, I might have to get refresh, sorry. Uh, I'm logged out, that's why. So we come back to that. So add, add this. Right, so the green line is the monitoring database running the same workload with the, with the default configuration from Amazon, and the blue line is, is AutoTune. So you can see at this, the peak performance, uh, AutoTune was getting 2,400 transactions a second, um, and the modern DB is, is doing roughly you know, 1,200 to 1,300 transactions a second. So again, same hardware, same cost on Amazon, it's just AutoTune has, has, has tailored this configuration for the, for this, for the, for the Blue database, um, specifically for the applications running on it, whereas Amazon is meant to be a general purpose or catch-all for all possible applications. So we can go under the configurations, and say we take this configuration here, and then we can do it, we compare it against the uh, the, the initial one, um, and then it just shows you what, what AutoTune has changed, right? Okay, so with that, um, we are done, and I'm happy to answer any questions either about AutoTune the product or AutoTune the record record label.
All right, so the question is, uh, is there a delta view showing the difference between the initial or default and the actual settings for the recommended information? That seems more useful than simply showing the actual values. All right, so yeah, there's comparison. Yes, you got that. OK. Um, Extras, extras are not mesh cache size tuning. So the cache size didn't for that Oracle data to the French bank. It didn't actually. It wasn't the bulk of the of, of the changes. Um, let's see here. It was this slide. Yeah. So this for this one here, the DB cache size. This didn't. This wasn't the the. the the largest factor of matters in terms of performance. The second one was actually mattered more because this database was like an internal uh, ticketing platform that they set up for the bank that's running you know 24 seven because the bank has 100,000 employees. Um, and so they're stored, they store a lot of blobs in there. Um, so this one mattered a lot. And then the, the, the feature enable one too was also significant. So again, from their perspective, they have hundreds of databases this is one that where they sort of thought like, yeah, we've tuned it. We thought we were handling this uh, correctly. And then we just showed them like, here's all the things that you were doing wrong. So this is actually this idea that AutoTune is not just only providing you better performance, but buying, providing you assurance that you're running, that the database, the database is running in its most optimal configuration at a really large scale. We think that's also very uh, enticing for people as well, right? The, the how to say this, the, the, in, the, in the travel website, there was actually a knob in MySQL that that for the adaptive hash index, and it's on by default. All the blogs say they leave it on, but they actually turned it off in, in a couple of cases. And we showed them that that was actually the right thing to do. So I think it's a combination of of, uh, and, and they were happy to know that that was the right thing to do. So it was a combination of both making things better and also long term providing you the guidance and um, the monitoring to know that things are running the way the best that they possibly could. All right, next question is uh, restarts, cache warming. Any thoughts about that? Do you have any tools to make restarts more palatable to users if they don't have cache warming procedures in place? Um, yeah, so, the, so no, we don't have anything. That's actually a good idea. Um, I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's the, the ability, you know, in the case of InnoDB, you can make it write out the page table to, to the contents of the page table on the disk. Uh, so when it bits back up, it loads that back in. Um, no, so we don't have anything in place, but this is something we 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 should we should consider. Yes. Does it tune optimizer switch in MySQL? Uh, I had to go double check. I, I don't know. Have you considered recording disk drive head movement sound before and after auto tune optimizes? Of course, releasing that as your audio on your audio label. That's actually a really good idea. We should do that. Uh, email me. We, we make that happen. Um, specifically, H AH1 has a heavily contested lock, which hits your performance as high QPS for many qu small queries and very uh, and very multiple CPU machines. Um, all right, that's, that's that's the MySQL question. So I agree, turning it off is the right thing. I'm missing the context with this. Sorry. OK, good. Awesome. Thank you. All right, any questions? So again, if you are interested in uh, trying out AutoTune, yeah, we currently in private beta. Um, if you go to uh, this URL here, autotune.com slash try, the form you can fill out and specify what, what database you want to do, when you want to tune, where is it running, uh, and then we'll reach out to you and figure out how to get, get you set up and get started. Okay. All right, guys, uh, with that, um, do I stick around or, or do I or not? Okay. I think I'm done. Okay, guys. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, just shoot me an email. I'm happy to chat with us. Okay.
Take care. See ya.